when you go through these these books, these letters, um, you can look at them a, a, a bunch of different ways. Um, and of course, there's always kind of the verse by verse kind of things that you can glean out. But as like an overhaul, overall looking at the book, you can look at certain things, certain topics um, that you can focus on uh, when you're going through the books. I can't kind of mention that with First Peter. The, the specific way we're looking at Philippians um, is through the um, lens of joy. How do you find joy in your life? How do you have joy? And we talked about the difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is built on what happens to you at the moment. Um, and it's an emotion just like sadness. And it, it comes and goes. And there's really nothing you can do to have forever eternal happiness. It's just impossible to have. But you can have joy. And for the most part, you can keep joy at all times. And we looked at uh, this book so far. And we've been through chapter one. How Paul is in the midst of of uh, house arrest. He's wearing chains. He's not able to go where he wants to. He's not able to ha have the freedom to encourage the brethren he wants or preach the gospel like he wants, but he still has joy. And joy is throughout this letter. Joy is on every page. Um, I forgot how many times. I want to say like like 16 times joy or rejoicing is is mentioned in, in this Bible It's or a derivative of that word. It is just all through this, he is full of joy, even though his situation is not what you would think to be one that's very happy. And so we looked at the last week, uh, or I guess it was a couple weeks ago because of the hurricane. Um, they, we looked at the first one, which was, it was a, a single-minded mindset. He was single-minded. He had, no matter what happened, it was with the kingdom in mind, with heaven in mind, with God in mind. And so if, if things happen to him and bad things happen, he said, you know, this has actually been for the, for the good of the gospel. And look how much good God's done through, oh, I'm put in a prison. And it, he mentions, this is where he says, if I, I die, if I um, live, it's Christ that dies gain. If I live, I'm working for you. I get to help the kingdom. I get to convert more people. I get to uplift the, the Christians that are already in Christ. But if I die, I get to be with heaven. And so no matter what happens to him, there is constant joy because he has a single mindset. And if we want to have joy, we must be single mindset. We're not able to go this way or that way, depending on what happens, but focus on Christ. And so when bad things happen, it's for Christ. If good things happen, it's for Christ. And that is the center of our ideology. The one that we're talking about in Philippians chapter 2 is a selfless mindset. The second mindset that you must have to have joy in your life is a selfless mindset. And this is kind of what we'll be looking at. This is how we break down this, this chapter. Uh, first, uh, one verses will be about humility, and then we'll talk about uh, what selfless behavior looks like, and then finally a couple examples in Timothy and Epaphroditus. He'll actually use four different examples in here. It's Christ himself and uh, Timothy and Epaphroditus, all that he makes reference to. Uh, that's another way you can actually look at Philippians is all the examples that he uses. So this is kind of how we'll look at the book. Any questions or comments to kind of kind of start out before we dive into chapter two? Anything on Philippians as a whole that you wanted to bring up? Okay, awesome. Let's dig right in. Um, this is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. This one is a good one to give you a good gut punch uh, to make you feel like you're not doing anything right in your life. So let's get into it. <laughs> um. Philippians chapter 2. I'm sorry that one's a bit small. It's just hard because of the this kind of po poetry lettering to get it all on one screen. So if you need to use your Bibles, you're, uh, you may. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if, you, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility value others above yourselves, not looking, not looking to your own interests, but the, each of you to the interest of others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used in his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, 
being made in the likeness, human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name of every name, that in every name, Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue and knowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. And we kind of see this, this change. He kind of started in verse 27 of chapter 1. He kind of uh, makes a little bit of change there where he goes from using his own self as the example from like verse 12 to verse 26 to verse 27. He, he talks about conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And he's kind of continuing that thought with uh, what we've read in the first 11 verses here. This is how you conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Why do you think there's such an emphasis on unity um, right here and, and, and specifically this letter? It tends to fall apart. And, and one is because you either turn on each other and you can point fingers or you get this like this hoarder mindset where you're like, I'm going to take care of me and mine. And it's the opposite of what he's talking about here. Instead of looking to others' interests and not my own, when scarcity happens and attack happens, we tend to, this, the natural instinct is to look for myself. I want to make sure I have enough and I have plenty. And so I'm going to look out for my interest instead of everyone else. And he says, you need to have the opposite of that. And that's what it means to have unity. And, and also look, um, verse 1 should spur verse 2. So verse 1, it says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, and you can almost at the end of these be like, and there is, there is encouragement from being united Christ. And if there's any comfort from his love, which there is, if there's any common sharing in the spirit, which you have, if any tenderness and compassion, if you feel any of those things for being Christ, then you must do what is in verse two, verse one, and, and what God has done for you and what Christ has done for you when it means to be a part of the kingdom if that spurs verse two by being like-minded and the same love and being one spirit and one mind. And, and so if you have a church that doesn't look like verse two, um, they're not like-minded, they're not in the same love, they're not being in one spirit, they're not one-minded, it's probably a church that doesn't realize what they have in verse one. They don't realize what they have in, in Christ. They're not, they don't have, they're not being encouraged, they don't have the comfort and love, and they don't know Christ like they should. Because if you you understand verse 1, and you understand and feel those things, then verse 2 should be what your natural response is. And I think he did it because he had a single-minded, he was focused on kingdom, and he did because he's, he wasn't concerned with himself as number one. He was concerned about the kingdom and God and others. That's what he was concerned about. And so if they were being helped and he could see the good that's happening for the kingdom, um, he had joy. Verse 1, the therefore... This is a conclusion for what he's been talking about in the previous three, uh, three, three or four verses um, in chapter, at the end of chapter one. So, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, how much of your own life and the decisions you make are made with yourself in mind? Because, like, uh, again, this was, the, I told you, this, 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 like, chapters are very much a gut punch. Uh, because you start like thinking, okay, how how many decisions, how much of my actions, how much of my thoughts, my motives, all of that is with myself in mind, not with anyone else, but just me in mind. And I think sometimes we 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 are selfless at times. We do this act, and we think, you know, okay, yeah, you know, I did that selfless act. I was good for that person. I let that one that guy in through in traffic. You know, look at me. I'm such a selfless, Christ-like person. Um, and instead of taking like the 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 full totality of, of our decisions and how much we do, uh, how much of our life is dedicated to looking at our own interests and not the interest of others. And I think that's, and I don't expect any answers necessarily, uh, but like it's, it's one of those questions that you think to yourself, like, am I, how humble am I? How selfless and is my mindset? And then, you know, if you really want to not, notch it up a step, he's going to be like, your, your relationship with one another should have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. And he's going to go on to describe what that means. And so, like, that's the bar that's, that's, been, that's been set. Um, and then I will also ask this. Uh, 
what things do we refuse to give up for others? What things have we said, okay, this person could really use our help um, or they have this need, but I really don't want to give up this, whether it be our time or money or effort or comfortability or comfort, um, the things that we value. What do we not give up for the sake of serving others? And then use that and you look at verse 6, who Christ is the example, who by being the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. He did not see like being God as something that he should hold on to um, and, and let the rest of us just handle our own business. He decided to let go of being, you know, God in the full glory of it and, and go to heaven to live as a human being. And the things that we hold on to are far less than that, I would imagine. Um, and yet we hold on to those, to the deficit of other people. Again, this is like the gut punch, like how selfish am I? Um, and, and how we view ourselves and their decision it is totally opposite of what humans do when they have power over others. Um, and you see that in, in his teaching, the greatest of you should be a servant. And he, again, he doesn't ask us to do anything that he didn't do. And probably to a much greater degree than he we have in our life. To add on to that and make it to a level of uncomfortability, Christ had that same mindset. Like it literally says that. He thought us more valuable than himself. Not that it was actually that, but he thought that. He thought uh, that we were more valuable than himself. Like he went about his actions in his day and his very life to, to, because he thought we were of value. Um, and that I don't like that. That seems uncomfortable, but that's how Jesus lived his life. And we should count each other the same way as um, more valuable than ourselves. And then I, I think I had this up here. Was it Jesus' selfless, selfless nature just a one action? No. And, and I think it, it, obviously the cross is the pinnacle of it, but it wasn't just that. It was a whole life that was dedicated to being selfless and for us. And like you, you like, and how do you make the comparison for us of going from God to a servant of a man? What is the comparison for us to to like a worm to to a Lego set? Like like what what is it like? I I, I don't think you can fully get there. Um, and, and yet that's what he gave up for us because he thought that, you know, we were valuable and that he wanted to save us through his love. I think the key is where do you get your value from? It's not because I think I'm so great because of all the stuff that I've done or, you know, stuff like that. That's not, or my riches or my power or my pro prosperity or my position or anything like that. It's that Jesus died for me and I'm working as, I'm a servant of God. That's where I get my value. I'm a servant of God, and Jesus died for me. And my whole value is built upon that, and Jesus doesn't make garbage. Jesus didn't die for trash. He, he died, he, that's, he thought so much of you that he died for you. I'll just point at the end um, that, you know, you get into verses 9 through 10, 11, where it talks about the exaltation of Jesus. And a lot of people, and even you know me, maybe in my earlier Christianity, I was like, ah, oh, that's the reason Jesus did it, because he can be exalted and every name would know him and that every knee should bow. Jesus was already God. Like he didn't come to the cross and go through everything to become a bigger God. Like he was God. Like that, that's not the reason that he did it. He did it because he loved us and he valued us and we should have the same mindset. Let's move to this second section, verse 12 through 18, verse 12 through 18. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to, in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault, in a warped and crooked generation." Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky, as you hold firmly in the word of life. And, and when 
I will be able to see. And then, that's it. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run and labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all, so that you too should be glad and rejoice with me. I, I think my first question was, was on that, is what does, it, what does Paul mean by continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling? What, what does Paul mean by um, saying those words? Um, I, I, I think there's, I think everything that you, you said is really good. I think there's a little bit more to it than it means. If you, if you look at like the context for which he is saying this, I, I think he, he's talking about there's a purpose for which God has saved you. Uh, that God didn't save you just to save you. There was, there was a purpose behind it for you to be a servant, to work in this kingdom for all of that. And you'll, you'll see that, um, there's a four there. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you will and to act according to fulfill his good purpose. And I think you're supposed to work out why God saved you and, and pursue that purpose. And I, I think that's continued in, in verse 14 and 15, that becoming blameless children, not complaining or arguing, um, all, all of those kinds of things. Um, and, uh, and I think this is also beyond just individual. I think he's talking to the whole congregation. I think he's saying you as the congregation continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Um, I think he's, and that's been the whole context throughout chapter two has been to the whole congregation. Um, and obviously that, that doesn't relieve the, the responsibility of the individual, but we're supposed to work together and we're supposed to strive together and all the, that kind of stuff. So baptism is not the end. It's, it's the beginning and, and it's, there's a continual process that goes along with it. A lot of it is following Christ and his example. And he showed it wasn't just his, he, you know, it was like, Oh, I love my brethren so much. He showed that in his, his action. But first I want to talk about this. Why do we grumble or complain and argue? Like what, it, why do we, uh, we participate in that kind of behavior is I don't like how things are going and I know better how this should be. And, and what's the focus in all of that? It's the total opposite of a selfless mindset. If, if you are grumbling and complaining and arguing, it's about me and what I want and that I think I know better than God, how my life should look like in the end. That's kind of what eventually is, is like, if you go up the, the ladders enough, that's what it is. It's telling God, I don't, um, I know better than you. And really, I, I don't know if I have this later, but this whole section that we're reading right now has a lot of um, allusions to Deuteronomy and Numbers. Um, he's going to, he literally quotes um, he, in verse um, 15, so they may become blameless and pure children of God without fault and it warped and crooked generation. That's from Deuteronomy chapter 32. Um, if the grumbling, I mean, that's something that the Israelites were famous for in the wilderness. They grumbled and complained constantly. Um, and, the, and God was always trying to make them children of God. That was his whole thing. Make them blameless and pure like himself. Uh, and so you have that as a background, it seems like, throughout this, this whole section right here. Uh, and like to stand out is the grumbling and arguing. And the Israelites thought they knew how to operate the world and what they thought should happen to them a lot more than, than God did. And I think if you're, you're in the word and you're in the gospel, I think that will naturally be something that comes out of it. Like if you're consistently in there and you let the gospel and God and the spirit take, part, take um, your heart and change you, I think that telling others will be a natural uh, thing to do. And like, if you want to stand out, he says, um, you know, if you can backtrack it, but he says, then you will shine a light. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. Well, how are you going to shine among them? Well, you're going to be blameless and pure uh, children of God without fault. Well, what is a part of that? Well, you do everything without grumbling and arguing. And so, like, do you want to shine out, shine um, like a light in this in this crooked generation? You don't complain, you don't argue, you are blameless, and you're pure, and you don't have any fault. You stand out.
And there's nothing like uh, on saying that you have to preach on a corner or anything like that. That by doing that, you will stand out among generations. Just by not complaining and arguing, you'll stand out. Like, have you seen social media? Or like, that's only half of Twitter is, is complaining and arguing. Is like sides going to each other. Uh, because that's just becoming more and more uh, of a thing. We're complaining, we're grumbling, we're arguing. You can't have a, a political discussion without this happening at all. Like, I don't think there's been a political discussion that's happened this year without one of these things happening. But if you did that, and you, and even in the realm of politics, if you just said, I really like this candidate, and here's all the great things that the that person does, without negatively saying someone else's candidate or anything like that, that stands out. And how would that shape your view of that? Or And, and then you apply that to your church or your people, and you just talk about the good people that are in that church or the good um, aspects of that person. You know, that stuff will stand out and it will change the way that you see the world by just talking about that stuff. Um, I, I think it's something that, that would really help us stand out if we would do stuff without grumbling or arguing. And, and like was said before, it usually comes about because we're not at work. The, the congregations that I've been part of that have the worst job at grumbling, complaining, arguing, getting in fights with each other, gossiping, all that kind of stuff, are the congregations that do not have an outward focus and have no evangelism going on at all in, in the church. What is the difference between complaining, arguing, all those things, and expressing our struggles or helping someone out? What, what's the difference behind that? And, and I, honestly, like I, I think everyone in, who's been a parent, grandparent, or has been involved in kids, you know the difference between your child or grandchild complaining and grumbling and them asking for something that they need or want. There, there's a difference, and you can tell the difference. Like it, It's not rocket silence to determine that. And so I, I think if we use that as our own kind of, uh, if we looked at ourselves honestly, and we can t tell when we're, we're grumbling and complaining uh, and when we're like, I'm really struggling. And, you know, even in our prayers, the Psalms are full of these where David's like, hey, I'm struggling. I feel forsaken. I feel lost. Like, where are you to help me? But there is a aspect of I always trust in you. I have faith in you that you're going to come in this, even though I feel this way. Um, and again, it's 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 a there's a God focus in there somewhere. Um, let, let's go ahead and answer this third question. Are there some things in this letter that help us uh, with not to grumble or argue? Um, are there some things that we've already talked about that kind of would lead us not to grumble, complain, or argue? Paul was in prison, and he said it was for good. Like, it, he, did, he could have complained about it. You can either help other people be selfless, or you can make it their job a lot harder. Yeah, good, good. Um, and just to point out, because we're running out of time, but being single-minded, if you have a focus on Christ and the kingdom, you're not going to complain as much. If you're uh, being selfless and you're looking at other people's interests and not your own, you're not going to complain as much. The, these are the if you're looking at Christ and what He's done for you and really take that in and understand that you're not as going to complain as much when your latte is not on, ready on time or whatever it is. Okay, uh, let's get to this last part really uh, quickly. Um, these so now that he's kind of set up the humility and the behaviors, he gives two examples of people that he thinks really did this really well. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you, you all soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests and not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proven himself because as a son when, with, with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. Now I am confident, Lord, that I myself will come soon. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you, to in, uh, for all of you and is distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died, but God had mercy on him, and not only him, uh, not him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am, I am all the more eager to send him, so that 
when you see him again, you may be glad and that I may have less anxiety. So then welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor. Uh, people, ah, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for, for the help you yourselves could not give. It really stinks when you study several translations and then you have them like all crossed to your brain. Um, okay, so um, what what are we told of Timothy and Epaphroditus that makes them such good examples that, that Paul wanted to point out? In this section, like everyone is caring for each other. Uh, between the Paul, the Philippians, Timothy, and Epaphroditus, they're all caring for each other. They're like, the Philippians sent Epaphroditus in the first place to care for Paul. And then, you know, Epaphroditus got sick, and so the Philippians are, are um, caring for Epaphroditus. And Epaphroditus heard that they were sick and concerned for them, so they care for the Philippians. And it's like one big circle. Like, they're all looking out for each other's needs, and they all care about each other, and they're all thinking about how each other, um, it affects each other. Um, and so, like, that is their focus, is, is, is each other. I, I think that's one of the big things that he's pointing about Timothy. He has a genuine concern for your welfare, which th- that there's a lot of different actions in that one little line that he says. And I think he's also, if you look at verse 20, the beginning of it, I have no one else like him. And in verse 21, for everyone looks out for their own interests and not those of Jesus Christ. It kind of seems like there's people around Paul that did not act like that. They didn't have genuine concern for their brother and they weren't willing to go through the things, the, the, um, humility, the, um, I don't know, the sacrifices that Timothy was willing to go through. They wanted their own interest and and not each other. And so, um, and it, it kind of sounds like Paul's a little disappointed about those around him. Um, that people are caring more about themselves than the kingdom. Uh, but he elevates Timothy and says, this is someone who actually really cares about those around him. And, and I think that was, Epaphroditus is a great example too. And, and then uh, he also says like, hold, hold such men, people like this in, in esteem. I think I have this. Uh, what is the value of elevating certain people who are doing a really good job? And I think this is, this is, this is something that he Paul is doing that he does really well. He's he could go on about this big long section about these people who are not doing what they should be doing and looking at their own interests. But he said he he says there are those people, and then he turns in and spends the majority of it and says, you know, look at these two men and the great examples they are. They're awesome at it and they do really good. Be like these men and esteem the people who are like these men. I think that really helps um, uh, encourage a a whole, you know, congregation, a whole church, and whole uh, everyone that hears that. Philippi, uh, Philippi was certainly included in the Macedonian uh, people. They were given generously. Um, uh, just a couple of questions uh, to consider: How can we develop a selfless mindset? You know, especially considering what we've we've looked at, the examples that we looked at, how you know both Timothy, Paphrodites, but mostly Christ and the humility that he's shown. Um, how, what behaviors does that look like? What kind of attitudes must we have? And then also, how does a selfless mindset lead to joy? Uh, most people would say that a selfless mindset would not lead to joy. The world would say that. You need to care about yourself and see how much you can get out of life. That gives you the most happiness in life. But I, I think that you find, you find the greatest joy in serving other people and giving your life for other people. And that is a joy that can't be taken away from you. It's not num- you can't number it. It, it. It's not in a bank account, but it is something that can never be taken from, away from you. And, and every day, every action and the things that you do has a purpose, and it, has, and it serves a greater purpose than yourself. And will be a long-lasting work that will live for eternity. And what greater joy can that be? So thank you for your uh, comments and your questions. We'll study uh, Philippians chapter 3, which is the third mindset of joy, which is a spiritual mindset. So thank you very much.